to the United States, uh, they assigned 100 of these secret agents on Minister Louis Farrakhan. The statement then was in the paper, in no time we'll have him blown out of the water. We're going to cause such a storm, we'll get Farrakhan. And let me tell you something, they raised the storm, but all storms are not there to put disruption in your life. Sometimes a storm comes just to clear the way for you. The forest looks healthy when you look at it, but some things are dead. But you can't tell it looking at the forest. So that's what the storm does. The storm goes through the forest. And when the storm is over, everything that wasn't living will be on the ground. Storms help you clean your house up. It shakes things up. And everything that's living is tied to that which gives life. And everything that is not living may be in close proximity, but they may not be connected to that which gives life. The storm will reveal it all in the end. So, as we get ready for this Savior's Day, we, we're right at the end of something and the beginning of something else. And uh, so we have been spending time to talk about the nation's program, and we don't have a lot of time today. We have another meeting in Coatesville, Pennsylvania today to go. But um, in the nation's program, which is on the back page of the paper, I learned after so many years to stop talking to people about what we want to do, why we want to do it, what we believe, and what we learn. Because it gets into a big discussion, never goes anywhere. Because it's not that we shouldn't talk about politics and shouldn't talk about religion. But it's really that people don't want to listen to what you have to say about politics and what you have to say about religion, especially if they're opposed to what you're saying. So it ends up getting nowhere. But um, on the back page of the paper, I've learned how to say to people, why don't you get one of these Final Call newspapers? Go home and read the 10 points of what we want and the 12 points of what we believe, then let's come back and have a conversation. Because then you have a problem with point number, well, now I can talk to you about that. We can zero right in on something, rather than talking all over the place, you know. And uh, so the last three weeks, we've been talking about the three essentials of life, freedom, justice, and equality. In fact, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad defined love as freedom, justice, and equality. And see, freedom, justice, and equality, when you're not free, when you're really not free, not just free to roam and be a freak, free to roam and be a criminal, but we're talking about free to be who God made you to be. When you're not that, then you're not getting justice. And if a way opens to you so that you can be free to be who God made you and you reject that, then you're being unjust to yourself. But freedom and justice and an equal opportunity in life are the essentials of living. So they represent love. 
so the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches. In the absence of that kind of justice, since justice is shown in this country as a woman blindfolded holding scales, not trying to look to favor any side against the other, then uh, when you don't have freedom, when you don't have justice, and when you don't have equality, you're mentally and emotionally imbalanced. Now the reason somebody will have a problem with me saying that is because we've taken the imbalanced conditioning that we have received from our slave masters for 460 years and we've normalized it. Well man, so and so, he was down the street, he just cussed out so and so and so and so, oh man, that's just the way he is. That's just the way he is. You know, if you told me something different, I'd really be concerned. Like he had a shirt and tie on and was talking in a distinguished way. You know, and that's why the scripture says they don't know him. They don't know us because they don't know him. Why does the scripture say that? Because once they became to know Christ, they begin to change. So when somebody says, man, you know so-and-so, uh, uh, Pookie, man, he, he had a tie and suit on, haircut, shoe shine, was talking all dignified and everything like that. And they, you know what somebody will say, uh, that, ain't, that ain't the nigga I know. What do you say? The one I know. He's funky, he drinks all the time, he always got a cigarette in his mouth, he's always... See, we don't normalize the thing that is absolutely abnormal for the original people. We need a teacher to come. We need somebody teaching us and guiding us and setting us up in a new form of training. Um... Yeah, so we're imbalanced. So when you take freedom out of the society, justice out of the society, and equality out of the society, now not only is the individual imbalanced, society is imbalanced. And you think you can practice injustice on another people and be just to your own. But it, this whole thing playing out in Washington, D.C. is showing us that ain't true. Much of what they have done to us over this 400 or more year sojourn, you're seeing it play out right there in Washington. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Somebody who could testify and show that you lying, show that you were really guilty of something, you just come up and say, they're not going to court. Come on. Jesus. Not going. Come on. Well, we're going to take a vote on it. Then you go vote on it and decide we don't want no witnesses to come and testify against them. Right. Well, what about the ones that did testify against them? They, they got escorted out of the White House by security for testifying right. to the truth. Why didn't you take them off to jail for perjury? Because they didn't lie. They told the truth. You're the liar. And they're protecting the lie by doing that. But they've been doing this to us for years. Yeah, so he, he, he is bringing it out. And the injustice that you practice on other people, you can't come back home and be just to yourself. So now white folks are angry. You got the Democrats all messed up. They messed up after a black man that you mistreated and his wife in the White House saved the doggone country for you with eight years. And, and he got the country in the worst condition any president ever received the country in. And so God has cast their minds into confusion. 
This did not just happen. This is an intention of Master Farad Muhammad to prevent them from succeeding. So a man, you say, well, we're going to have the Iowa caucuses. How can you use Iowa? That's, it was 3% black. I think it's 2.5% black now. So a whole state with hardly no black people in it. And the Democrats are using Iowa caucuses. And your most loyal voting bloc is black women who don't even live in Iowa. Well, we ain't thinking about them right now. Right now, we think about what these white folks in Iowa got to say. So the guy who brought his husband up and they kissed in the mouth in front of the folks and that, they mess, we mess around with them and I, he's up at the top. If that keeps happening in every primary, you really got something going on. You had a black couple in the White House for eight years with no scandal. That's, that's hard for Washington. Go eight years, it's usually somebody in your club going to jail. These people went to jail for Trump got sworn in. Stone is in jail. Manafort is in jail. Flynn is in jail. Cohen is in jail. He tried to, tried to talk on Trump. They said, no, get on, lock him up. So, you know, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan foresaw this and told us they, they're going to start to unravel it. And so we're sitting here like in a theater watching this thing yes, sir. go down. Yes, and black folks got their leadership trying to rush them into the house of confusion. If ever there was a time to listen to Louis Farrakhan, you're in that time right now. So, the fourth point, since we can't get freedom, justice, and equality in the socio-political context of America, we want our people in America whose parents or grandparents were descendants from slaves to be allowed to establish a separate state or territory of their own, either on this continent or elsewhere. We believe that our former slave masters are obligated to provide such land uh, and that the area, don't just throw us any kind of thing, the area must be fertile and minerally rich. We believe that our former slave masters are obligated to maintain and supply our needs in this separate territory for the next 20 to 25 years until we are unable to produce and until we are able to produce and supply our own needs. Since we cannot get along with them in peace, and equality after giving them 400 years of our sweat and blood and receiving in return some of the worst treatment human beings have ever experienced. We believe our contributions to this land and the suffering forced upon us by white America justifies our demand for complete separation in a state or territory of our own. When you've been brought up in a completely dependent state to another people for over four centuries, the thought of separation scares the hell out of you. Separation that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is bringing up 
here in this point number four is not a political argument. It was the solution offered by God through Moses to Pharaoh. He always said the solution to our problem is divine. The call for separation came from God. So Moses did not say, let us go, that we may go in the wilderness and worship our God. He said, thus saith the Lord, let my people go. Not just to the land flowing with milk and honey. He said, let my people go that they may come in the wilderness and worship me. Well, wait a minute now. Why do they have to, who were they worshiping before? You came. Who was the God for them before you came? See, we're reading things in the scripture, but we're not paying attention. And it's costing us, as the honorable Elijah Muhammad said, and I'm going to read from that, but two-thirds of the Holy Quran deals with Moses and the children of Israel. The people in Arabia were in no way in a condition like the children of Israel are described in um, uh, the scriptures in the book of Exodus or the Holy Quran. So why would a prophet in an Arabian desert get a revelation and two-thirds of it is dealing with seemingly another people? Another whole regiment when the Arabs were never under a supreme ruler of the land. The Arabs were victims of their own superstitions, conditions that they had brought about, and polytheism. But Pharaoh is a definite ruler who contends with God through his servant. That didn't happen in Arabia. So if I'm in Arabia and I'm suffering from vices that I brought on myself and we're suffering from vices and superstitions and things and we want to get cleared up and see the truth of God, I can benefit from the Quran, but two thirds of the Quran is not really dealing with my situation. Well then whose situation is it dealing with? The Arabs weren't enslaved for 400 years. The Arabs weren't completely mastered and managed by a ruler and his people for over 400 years. The Arabs never separated. They never had an exodus. The only reason they sallied forth in the earth is because Islam is a fire teaching. And what you can't do, you can't fire people up and then leave them just sitting. If you leave them sitting, you're going to burn your own house down. You got to give them an assignment and send them out. We're in training. Just hold on. The minister is already asking, can you speak another language? Come on, come on, that's right, that's right. I can't sally forth in the earth. I'm barely speaking English. I'm more Ebonics. I go somewhere, they won't even know what I'm saying about the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Although English is more widespread than you think. Um, What's the goal here, Mr. Muhammad?
to take a state or territory. A st student minister Ava Muhammad will be holding a town hall meeting on this in Detroit, the Church of the Black Madonna. And um, we're expecting a crowd out there, of course, to talk about this. And you're finding a lot more people in black America are ready to talk about this. We're segregated anyway. Segregated means you are separated, but he's still controlling all your affairs. He controls the ideas that you labor under. He's providing you with your own value system. How's he able to do all that? Because he gives you your God. And he gives you your Savior. The goal is not separation. Separation is a tool. The goal is independence. And to be independent, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, you must have land. You got to have some of this earth you can call your own. Now you, you're standing on your own ground, you can call it like you see it. You can begin to exercise your own ideas and your own way of life in that. But without a teacher, without somebody to re-educate us and retrain us, separation is just geography. You can go somewhere else but you're going to act just like the white man when you get there because that's all we've learned. I appreciate our nationalist brothers and sisters, but after all the years of nationalism, there was such a conflict that they came to the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and said, Minister Farrakhan, if you write a letter, with your letterhead to all the nationalist leaders, then we could unite them. So the nationalists couldn't even unite themselves after so long. See, we need something more. The things we got look attractive, but if they was pulling this off, you would see a lot of these communities together and thriving. So Mr. Muhammad says, look, state or, or territory, and uh, Minister Ava described that so eloquently. He didn't just say territory, state, because every state got its own constitution already. Right? Every state has its own flag already. So in one way, a state is like a sovereign territory. And it uses a larger corporate overhead called the federal government. People from all the states pay federal taxes. The money goes to the federal government. Every state is entitled because their citizens gave to the federal government to get some of that federal money back in their state. The federal government then um, says, OK, you got the money. The state then begins to determine how they're going to use the money that they got from the federal government. Now, all the federal government wants to know is, well, who do you have there? Well, we got a house full of folks here. Well, when we look at the sheet, you don't have that many people. And you know why? Because we're not filling out the census. So when you don't fill out the census, the mathematical calculation in Pennsylvania is you lose a minimum of $3,000 in federal funding from every person that doesn't fill out the census. Well, I don't want the government knowing about You think they don't know about you already? Ronald Reagan had a book 
called Reaganomics. Chapter 3. If you ever get that book, read chapter 3. It's called The Subterranean Economy. Ronald Reagan never believed that poor people were really poor in the way that they were suffering. He said, you think they're poor, uh, but they got Cadillacs. It's in, it's in my mom-in-law's name. and They got, you talking about, well, look where they live up in here. But you go up in some of them spots. I know in Chicago, you go down to Robert Taylor Homes, you, you go up in some of the spots. Shag carpet, smoke glass tables when that stuff was out. Uh, minks, right? Come on now. People learn how to survive. We the, this is the tribe of Shabazz I'm talking to. A jungle is a jungle. Asphalt jungle or not, we learned how to survive. And remember the woman, the black woman came from Chicago who was cashing, she had a scheme, she was cashing about 113 welfare checks, right? And, and when they caught her, she had a mink on and everything, but she was supposed to be poor as hell. You'd have been feeling sorry for her if you heard how poor she was supposed to be. So Reagan, Reagan's thing was, these people ain't poor. They don't fill out 1040s. I knew people like that. They live right out of their pocket. They cash, cash and carry. They don't fill out no. So when you don't fill out 1040s and stuff, you know, you kind of off the record. Remember in, in Goodfellas, when he finally got busted at the end? He said, man, we had the life. He said all our driver's license, our social security card, they were all phonies. They, they um, made up other people uh, and got apartments and condos all over the city where they can go live at any time and stuff. People around here living under the radar. And that's what Ronald Reagan was saying. Now, that don't mean some people ain't getting hit hard. And poverty is real. But Reagan was trying to make light of the poverty. And see, they're trying to make light of it now because they're getting ready to take your Social Security. They, they're getting ready to take your Social Security. And you know what he does? The minister, now see, the minister taught us he uses language. Let me just show you something from the scripture. Uh, the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded, the same day to the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying this, ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore let them go and gather straw for themselves. In other words, you know, uh, the cost of living is going to go up, your paycheck going to be less, are you listening to me now? And as you, we're not talking about building bricks. We're talking about building a life for yourself. And the tally of bricks shall not go down. And we expect you to carry these burdens. So you worked, put your money into Social Security and that. They want that money to pay for the greed at the top, so they change the language. And they call it an entitlement. Well, we've got to cut some government entitlements. That's not an entitlement. You put that money in there. But notice there's no real outcry from the people because they've soothed the talk with the language. But it should be an outcry in every city 
especially from people that's getting Social Security. So they, they, they want to rob that treasury, and so they're using Mitch McConnell of the Senate to do it. They're taking away, they're keeping the demand, the cost of living demand on you. That's the brick, but your ability to meet that demand, you got less straw. So they're not going to get better. And we're saying we need to be independent of them. That's right. And we need to be able to operate on each other. Well, you know, uh, black people, we, we got to get ourselves together. That's why we're here, trying to get ourselves together while we're with them. But every day I see the cry of black people that we're not getting justice. I see the cry of black people that you feel discriminated against. Either you got a job and they're not paying you what you're worth. You went to school, you got all the degrees, you said, I went and tried to get as much straw as I can get, but you can't make a brick because they won't give you a job and what you majored in. Notwithstanding, that to be independent, you got to take responsibility for your own weight. As we talked about, when the child first stands up, it usually falls because they never felt the full weight of their body. So when you stand up as a people, you begin to feel the weight of your existence. Who's going to teach our children? Where are we, where we going to get our next sandwich from? I'm hungry. Huh? You know, this thing I've been wearing for the last 16 years is tearing. I need something new. Who's going to sew a new garment? So, Mr. Muhammad, Mr. Muhammad said, we want for our 20 million people here in America what white America has for herself. Then he tells us, you are a nation within a nation, depending on white America for sole existence, without trying or even seeking a chance to try and do something for self, other than to beg for that which belongs to white America. You beg as though you are too lazy to work and build a future for self. What future? does 20 million non-whites have in their slave masters? Is not it clear to you that your hopes of existence depend only on whatever type of labor the white man will offer you? Can you hope to continue seeking employment for your 20 million, it was 20 million of us then, it's over 46 to 48 million now. 20 million people in factories and in their offices while he already has unemployment among his own, which is increasing daily. The ever-changing map, Mr. Muhammad said, of the white world is increasing their own problem of existence. You may be unable to see and foresee this. This is why we would like to help you see 20 million ex-slaves failing or refusing to see and go for self today will prove to be fatal for them in the near future. If the blind cannot see his own way and refuses to be led by the hand of the seeing man, who then can be sorry for his stumbles and his falls. Yeah, so see, Mr. Muhammad is saying, I'm not going to stand here and cry over the condition that you're in because in a large part, we're in the condition that we're in because we can't see. Well, Muhammad, you just need to help us get $15 an hour. Do you realize by the time you get the $15, 
Reverend Jackson already said this, five million of the jobs gonna be snatched through automation. Machines don't call in sick. Machine, machines don't say, I gotta get down to the school, take off today to get down because my child is having, they, they, they wanna put my child on Ritalin and I got to go down and talk to the principal about this and that. Machines don't take off for that. The machine does exactly what he wants it to do for him. He don't have to give it no paycheck. It don't need health care. Come on, somebody. You ain't got to pay a machine pension. This man is trying to cut corners. He's sitting up using his best minds. And while people are arguing that Burger King and McDonald's and everybody should pay the $15 wage, he's already got a machine that's going to be able to slide the sandwich out to you. They were showing it's going to dump it. You want chili? This man is not playing. And so Mr. Muhammad said, so as he works to build devices and machines, he's putting us in the bread lines. And soon the bread lines will grow. So um, our separation is to achieve an independent state. And we've already started conditioning. We ain't got time to argue about you know, whether you wear red tam or blue tam and that, we just talking about just bring everybody and we'll get down with all that later. We're trying to argue and settle everything before we separate. Uh, but our, our separation is imminent. And the true separation, Mr. Muhammad said, is with the righteous and the wicked. So with the wicked, you may get some black people that want to stay with the folks. Like some of them that work on Fox News. I can't believe the way they're talking. That's just incredible. But there's a whole following because when Donald Trump ran last time, he got 8% of the black vote. So when you count that out, that's still quite a few people. And now, one brother is using his foundation and he's giving out money to black folks to come on board with Trump. Now, it sounds ridiculous. It sounds like somebody's going to say, man, get the hell out of here and stuff. You really? You think people are not going to take that money? So, the country's in a hell of a state. And what they just did with the whole impeachment process, the reason I'm talking about a lot of that is because when we were at the Watergate Hotel, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan said Trump is the last president. So I said either the country going to fall now or it got somewhere inside of four years because this is election year. And they intend to get him back in. So how do they get him back in? Create confusion. And by the time we get through arguing over the different Democrats, and now Bloomberg done jumped in, well, he's a billionaire, he was with, the, you know, and we're running our damn mouth. Don't have a plan. Have no plan. Well, brother, brother. Rodney, real leadership, we should speak truth to power. By now, you should be exercising power. If you're a shepherd and your sheep are grazing, the thing that's on your mind is, when they finish grazing here, where am I going to take them? I don't have time to read all of what Mr. Muhammad said the leadership is doing to us, but he wrote these articles in the 40s and the 50s. And doggone it, they're doing the same thing. They haven't taken the sheep nowhere. They keep taking you back to the one that's shearing the sheep and killing us. Separation. 
And they hate for you to talk about that. I've only talked to, since I've been a minister in the Nation of Islam, a student minister, I've only talked to two almost completely white audiences. And in the question and answer period, after I spoke, I always get two questions. I don't care if they ask 20 questions, two of them you're going to always get. One, do y'all still call us the devil? That troubled them. That, that was troubling. And the other one is, why do you all want to separate? Think about that's on their mind. You know, like, am I that bad? So Mr. Muhammad is telling us, you know, and we're supposed to be so um, filled with self-hate that... Um, the only time you can really get us to kind of be joyous with each other is have some good food and some liquor. But, but when you see... <laughs> but just think about it. Think about how they do us. But, uh, but you know, white folks see us in the Savior's Day convention, they're fascinated, especially with the sisters. Black women coming back out through the hotel lobbies, not scantily dressed, not rolling their eyes at each other, happy to see each other running across at a salam alaikum, and they just, they cheek to cheeking and everything, and everybody's all lovey dovey and everything. They're fascinated with that because we should be filled with self hatred, distrust. Submission. So it shows you the work of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan yes, that we're getting some kind of traction. Right, right. And we're still sitting in the worst condition. We got agents among us trying to, trying to pit us against each other. We got unhappy people among us trying to pit us against each other. But in spite of all that, our prayers and our praise to our God and our loyalty to their servant, the Honorable Louis Farquhar, we're overriding it. Well, I don't like this. You ain't got nothing perfect in this world. This world is, for the human being, is the poor part of the planet Earth. The minister said, it's designed to show us the worst that's in us. <laughs> but, but despite it all, if you continue to feed on the word of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, you always got something that lifts you mentally, lifts your spirit, and your emotions. There's an answer to everything. And when you got a disease in the heart, every opportunity looks like a difficulty. And when you got the love of God and his messenger in your heart, every difficulty is an opportunity. Nothing is impossible with God. Even a nation of our own. And these little tiny moss sitting in the earth is just a, a small way of us trying to learn how to live under a different kind of rule and regulation and to set up a new kind of culture and retrain us so you don't believe the first thing you hear. Right? 
You can't live by what the Holy Quran says. The Holy Quran says, when an unrighteous man bring you news, look carefully into it. Most black people, when unrighteous people bring you news, you believe it on the spot. They just, and I'm closing with this, this thing with Gail King and the interview with a close friend of Kobe Bryant. Now, there are problems that I still have with Gail King. But the part of the interview that she began to question Kobe Bryant and the rape case um, that ultimately was dropped and there was an out-of-court settlement. Um, I still feel that she was leading with questions rather than just asking a question. Designed to something and, but if you hear the entire interview, the entire interview was nothing like the clip that they showed. So Oprah's crying about her friend and everything. Now, I still have a problem with them because how come none of these white folks have been in these interviews? When the Me Too movement started, it was a whole chart of white people up there. Charlie Rose, you got Matt Lauer of the Today Show, you got this Weinstein guy. I mean, he's, he's about to go to jail. And this pictures with Gail and Oprah with this guy, and they ain't never brought him up for questioning. Everybody they brought, R. Kelly, right. this black person, they wanted to go after Russell Simmons and different people, but I'm saying, where, where are these white boys come? If it's real, honest uh, journalism that's completely objective, then bring the white ones on up too. And they're not doing that. But, but when I first heard it, my... The first thing hit my mind was, let me look into it. And I'm finding I'm doing that a whole lot when stuff comes up. Because with social media, people can design that thing and then lay out a bed of comments and you already letting them shape your opinion without you looking into it first. No, we got to have stronger minds than that. That's why Master Farad Muhammad wrote the actual facts out with his own hand. Come on, somebody. When you read the actual facts, the moon is not in there. When you read the actual facts, the stars are not in there. The only thing that's in the actual facts is what was done by the hand of the originator. Well, why did you write it out with your own hand to show us that the work of the originator is in his hand now? And so I got to train the people that I'm teaching through my messengers. If they're going to be like me, see, if they're going to be like me, we got to go back to the work that was done in the beginning. And they got to be trained in facts. So that you search a thing out for the facts of it before you accept it as the truth. Part of why we're in what we're in now as black people is we have taken some things as the truth without facts. For years, they said the nation killed Malcolm X. For years, they said Elijah Muhammad ordered the killing of Malcolm X. Now, Netflix has a series on, and the state prosecutor of New York they about to reopen the Malcolm X case. Farrakhan been saying for years, bring the files out. Let's look at the facts. Negroes running around parroting white folks. Y'all killed Malcolm. That used to make college so mad. He said, if we did kill Malcolm, we would tell you. And then find out what the hell you want to do about it. They killed King, you ain't done nothing about it. They killed Mega Evans, you ain't done nothing about it. They killed King's mother in the church, you ain't done nothing about it. What the hell are you gonna do if we did kill Malcolm X? Ain't nobody got a lie to you, you ain't followed up on nobody. 
that this country has brought down, male or female. And then we got to sneak around and lie to you about Malcolm X. So I thank you all for listening. Assalamu alaikum. Well, we thank you all for being out with us. Is there any of you that's out for your first time, never been out with us before? All right, thank you all very much. Thank you so much, beloved. If you're out for your first time uh, and you've never been out with us before, how many of you feel what you're hearing from us today is the truth and good for us as a people? Can I just see by a show of hands? And Thank you all so much, thank you. Well, the most important question I could ask in the short time that we have is the Honorable Louis Farrakhan extending to you an invitation to become a part of a nation that God is blessing him to build. We have, we have affiliation and fellowship all over the planet now with little mosques and temples just like the one you're in today. And so our family in Philadelphia welcomes you based on the Honorable Louis Farrakhan's invitation to come to Islam, not to join it, but to accept your own nature that we know from our investigation is the nature that God has already created you in. So we say, you're not joining here, you're accepting your own. Uh, and we are part of that, okay? So is there anyone wanna come and answer Minister Farrakhan's call, or his invitation and that? And you can just do that by shaking my little hand. I'm just a little helper of his in Philadelphia, and I'd be more than pleased to shake your hand and let him know that you would like to become a part. You wanna come up, brother? Come on that way. Come on that way. Thank you. All praise is due to Allah. Thank you all so much. Okay. What's your name? Andre? Yes. Brother Andre, how you doing, beloved? All right, got a cold? Okay, okay. This is Brother Andre. Give him a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. He's going to talk to you right there. If there's anyone else, male or female, you know, um, you, this is a good opportunity for you to come forth. Every Saturday morning, the women are here. 10 a.m., you're invited out. You can tell other women so that you can learn more about what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who he was, what he, what he teaches, what, who is Minister Louis Farrakhan, and what is he teaching us right now. You know, and try it on. We, we, we're listening to some of everybody out there now. With this social media, everybody's getting a crack at it. You know, but you come on down and hear what Minister Louis Farrakhan is saying. Uh, even as our city is creeping up on this 40th murder already. Um, and now they're putting a black woman over it. And I hope they let her do her job of what she wants to do. She's going to need our help. You know, but she's got to learn the real players here and, you know, uh, what's going on in these neighborhoods. But anyway, um, every Monday night for the men, we meet right here at 730. We'll be here tomorrow night, right? Yes, sir. All right. Good, good, good. As we're getting ready for Savior's Day now, some of you, a lot of you that are not traveling to our Savior's Day on that Sunday, I think we're, we're going to webcast. And so you'll get to see Minister Louis Farrakhan live in real time of sitting right here in this mosque on that Sunday. We'll be in Detroit with him, inshallah, uh, but you'll be able to, to be out and be a part of that. Are they webcasting uh, the town hall meeting? Did we get any other information on the workshop? Okay, so um, with that done, yes. Uh, the final call banquet, the $100 tickets, okay see you about them everyone that wants to be at that banquet now the final call newspaper that minister farrakhan started right there in his home on damon avenue to get i mean <clears throat> um the 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 first paper wow boy that goes back it takes me back to that paper but um the uh the final call banquet is on that saturday night and so s friday night Friday night, 
uh, there in Detroit, Michigan. And so see, see our protocol director about that and get more information about that banquet, okay? Um, the, uh, I'm going to let Brother Joseph announce these as we get ready for the other. But Wednesday night, we're going to be out for the, for the webathon. Um, you can bring a guest out. We have a wonderful time. We have some refreshments, right? We have some refreshments out, but the Nation of Islam is working on our nationwide, worldwide now, uh, giving to help the Honorable Louis Farrakhan through a Savior's Day gift. And so the many cities will be recording right there on the screen. You will, will be tied into California, will be tied into Chicago, will be tied into New York, uh, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Georgia, and many other cities as people gather in all the cities uh, in our giving, okay? So that'll be uh, this Wednesday night. Um, and um, we just talked about the banquet. Okay, so Brother Joseph will close us out in prayer uh, after we do the, collect the charity collection, okay? Yes, sir. Thanks. So give him another round of applause, our Delaware Valley Student Regional Minister, Rodney Muhammad. So dear family, as he just uh, shared with us, this is the charity portion of our program. And what we're going to do is, if we have any, anyone who would be willing to help with this cause, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, if you, how many hundred dollar donators do we have today? Any hundred dollar donators? Hundred dollars? Well, while that simmers, I'm going to go to fifty dollars. Any 